That is a very profound statement. And he should know as one of the greatest composers of our time, he played a huge part in the storytelling of cinema. Take any great moment in the history of modern cinema and it is almost always driven by music. It is, after all, the biggest tool in the emotion box. Music is 50%, but sound is unequivocally as vital to our connection, in many ways far more than the visuals. We can accept a poor image, drastic cuts or inconsistent imagery far easier than the same thing for sound. It impacts and disconnects us. It betrays intent, description, emotion, pretty much anything at all. Take it all away and the picture is incomplete. Yet largely we do take it for granted, certainly in gaming nowadays. However though, this was not always the case. Sound was one of the most transformative and impactful elements of gaming throughout its formative years, and it never started with it. Right up to the late 90s and early 2000s, it was a focal area for game development and growth. The history of game and sound creation, the battles of audio producers, foley artists and space saving development is a vast, explosive and exciting saga, yet it is rarely given the love it so richly deserves. I plan to change all that with this, my exhaustive history of sound retrospective series. I plan to lavish your brains with info, ears with wonder and eyes with colour, all the while making your hairs stand on end. So settle down as I take you on a long, troubled and ear-piercing adventure into sound. Here we go. Video games followed the trend of cinema. Silence. Just as the pioneering stars of Lloyd, Keaton and Chaplin, the only sounds were the audience gasps in awe or the riotous laughter. In 1958, time had moved on and movies had long since shifted into talkies. You ain't heard nothing yet. Video games did not yet exist, but there was time for tennis. Tennis for two. This pioneering game was the creation of physicist William Higginbotham, one of the inventors of the nuclear bomb and radar, also created the biggest entertainment business of today by happenstance. This simple line and pixel ball was created to entice visitors to the annual laboratory of science demonstration. It was a rousing success, but was merely a throwaway side project for Higgin, who never saw a long-term impact from it beside this short crowd drawer. His expertise in radar technology stands out with the game having a more frantic and physics-based movement than the later Pong it so clearly inspired, and for all it gained in oscilloscope rendered movement it lacked in sound, with the action being completely silent as you blip the pixel back and forth. The star of the show was muted, but the crowd's enthusiasm was heard, eventually. In space, no one can hear you scream, or even shoot, it seems. Space War is the very first creation you can still associate as a video game today. Created in the early 60s on the PDP-1, it resembles games we know since, such as Asteroids, Defender or Jetpack, although the original was silent and based on direct logic gates, no microprocessor here. At the time, a state-of-the-art powerhouse with 18-bit word process data pipeline, programmed via data feeds, punch paper into the system. Now, this is very similar to those punch cards you remember from school and it was all controlled via a switch input to assign the relay gates and logic for simple gate switching one at a time and this is where that retro futuristic look came from where everyone in the 70s and 80s movies was turning dials and flicking switches to make the computer do exactly what they wanted <laughs> Now 
and the sheer computational power needed to run a game and sound in parallel was not really possible. It could produce some decent chip theme wave melodies by using those relay gates and registers to turn tones on and off. It just couldn't do this at the same time as running a game. Remember, this was the pinnacle of real-time interactive entertainment, and this game itself only ran in 4 kilobytes of space. That's 68 times less space than the sample it takes for me to say 4 kilobytes. It's an impressive look back into our history of video game technology, but sound still wasn't part of it. And although the original was silent, later iterations of it added some attempts at sound in the early 60s. Nothing more than flip flaps and white noise, but it portrayed the atmosphere of space as you drifted around avoiding the supernova Dark Star. Well, hang on, now. give me the gun. You don't know what you're doing. You're a star. You could have killed me. The needle or wedge ships battled it out with torpedoes and hyperspace. Two player gaming was available from the start. But this was not only the inspiration of video games we now know of, with it being the very first to use weapons, but it was also the catalyst for the father of early consoles and arcades in Atari. The early 70s is when Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney took Space Wars and they made the very first commercial arcade game in 1971's Computer Space. Taking the exact same premise of Space Wars but refining it for a commercial existence, most importantly was improving and adding those specific sound effects. No longer was the action just visual but now your rocket thrusts, torpedoes and explosions all had unique effects to enhance them. Incredibly simple wave patterns that are mere blips, beeps and white noise. Minor as it may be though, it added a great deal to the game's presence and the relative success of the game and the revenue was enough for Bushnell to commit, creating a brand new marketplace for gaming and it sounded like a great plan. It's one that only took them a further year to realise with its next arcade. Another muse, as already discussed, and from Magnavotsky's Tennis for Two, but this time sound was to become far more than a mere bit part. Yes, if you are old enough to have been around during the Pong craze, those sounds of repetition hold a special place. Al Acorn, the technical lead at Atari, had very limited hardware at his disposal. All assembled by himself, cost was, as always, a key constraint. Nevertheless, the ask from Bushnell and Dabney was to have crowd cheers, boos and impact of the ball. Having only very basic noise creation hardware to work with, he had to rein in these as then lofty aspirations. Samples were not possible on the hardware, no sufficient space or any real techniques even existed. In fact, the sounds are simply all that could be produced by the electronic circuitry. He actually used the sync generator on the display. Nothing was stored anywhere as the entire game ran on relays and logic gates. Now, history states he did the best he could to create three distinct samples waves across three frequencies and durations. Two of those are octaves, so they ring out from wall ping and paddle pong. The odd one out though is that semitone of the point or miss. It alerts you to the drastic change, either win or lose side. This shift in duration and pitch gives the game its unique signature, like a game show buzzer for the wrong answer. The sound of Pong is immediately recognisable. As the ball pings off the walls across the court, you instantly know the game without seeing those equally iconic visuals. 
Pong is regarded as the true grandfather of video games in many ways, and sound is consonantly as prolific. This was not only the beginnings of the behemoth it would become, but also the day games made that first giant step from silent to talkies, with sound and action combined, symbiotic and central to the game itself, and this set us on the long journey ahead. Now, over the next couple of years, things moved on slowly. Breakout was more of an extension of Pong, and just like today, copycats popped up everywhere, with the Pong clones becoming a bedrock for entire businesses and investment plans in the mid-70s. Even Nintendo themselves started here, with Pong being the step up to the NES. Atari knew they had to change the game again and created the video computer system in 1977 which came with many games including Pong of course. One of the big leaps aside changeable games via the cartridge format which was revolutionised by the Fairfield F was the extra power and the monstrous 128 bytes of RAM afforded. Sound was moving up the stack. It was a great enabler for teams to get stuck into using it to improve the games and experience, and Pong itself never sounded so good. With the brand new system offering a combined multi-purpose ASIC, designed by genius J Minor, yes the very same of the Commodore Amiga fame, the Television Interface Adapter or TIA drove the graphics display, polled inputs and generated all sound via its dual channels. These were dual oscillators that could create frequencies via a 5-bit register combined with a 4-bit pulse wave controller and a 4-bit volume controller. These individualized variables could be combined with a 13-bit set which enabled waves, white noise and other combinations which could be sent from a digital source out through the DAC and then through the mono TV speakers. Obviously archaic by today's standards but a true revolution that enabled many impressive tunes and sound effects to be enjoyed on this 70s station wagon console. The fuzzy white noise and short tone beeps, enveloped reverberated explosions are what still endure today as video game sounds. Whenever you hear them or walk into an arcade, that's the kind of sound effects that still resonate as that sound of an arcade or early video games. collection of titles on the console did utilize the sound well to give a mixture of sound effects and some light tunes but the true pop culture came from Japan and Taito's seminal Space Invaders in 1978. The world and our ears were never the same again. Tato's object-orientated pioneer built sound right into the game's core mechanic. The first game to do that. Anyone who played this game back then or up to the early 80s can understand the urgency and individuality the game's soundtrack delivered. Using a heartbeat rhythm to portray the tension of the game loop, as you cleared the edges the pace moved up. A rhythmic beat hits your core, making you anxious to clear the descending hordes, increasing your mistakes. It is the very first example I can recall where sound not only enhanced the visuals, it underpinned the gameplay and was woven into its heart unlike anything else prior. The psychology involved here is astounding, as the combination of the elevated pitch increase in tempo and the visual update, which was a byproduct of the game's object-based design, speeding up the logic as less invaders appear at the extremities, means the sound is as vital to space invaders as the electroid enemy on the cabinet side. Due to this cadence of a drumbeat, it is also the pioneer of video game music during gameplay. Like most fledgling elements, it is limited and will continue to be so for many reasons and many years to come, one of those being hardware and obviously space limitations. 
but the game itself was a true catalyst of the arcade and gaming market. Here in the UK, it was simply the game, the only game. Outside of Japan, where arcades ruled, the UK was the single biggest market, much larger than the US at the time. Space Invaders was the talk of the town, school, workplace, machines cropped up not only in full-blown arcades or down by the seafront, but in chip shops, pubs, youth clubs and even cafes, with the constant craze to secure the high score on the leaderboard. It was a phenomenon that you simply cannot understand unless you were there, as it created an entirely new form of entertainment, and it pushed the market over that $1 billion mark in 1978. As small as it was, relatively, Space Invaders made a loud and long-lasting impact. <laughs> nothing lasts forever and the VCS craze had dulled. Thanks to dwindling sales, Atari needed to raise its profile and the impact Space Invaders was making was impossible to ignore. One deal later with Taito, it single-handedly in 1980 rescued sales and became the title that coined the killer app or system seller as it delivered on every front. As sound was a key element of the title, it was allocated a healthy budget on the ROM alongside a good slice of those vital CPU cycles. To ensure the audio via wave generation patterns was up to the arcade origins it so obviously aspired to be. And it achieved them at some level as the game was a smash hit with a very close port for such limited specifications. It was such an influential title that it is now regarded as pop icon with its very design influencing everything from pop bands, adverts, movies and even modern art. Limitations are apparent though, obviously the dual channels limits the amount of sounds it can play at one time, something which endured actually through the 80s and 90s on many a piece of hardware. You can hear it in the title when you shoot, the gun sound that comes from your uh, laser blast is muted or completely turned off when the mothership goes across the top. Even with these limitations, it was a superb conversion that managed to seal the deal in terms of convincing you you had the arcade in your home, although this was still the day when it was many, many moons before you ever had Arcade Perfect, even though companies claimed it for many years to come. And this wraps up part one. We've moved into the all-important 80s and there's much more to discuss. There's more to discuss on the Atari VCS itself with that Pac-Man port and the music that that actually ushered in and many other arcade titles. And then we enter into that 8-bit micro, the most important time in terms of music. And there was one particular machine that I think many of you are looking forward to digging into. The C64 and that SID chip was made to shine over and over again and still endure as one of the most impressive and iconic sounding machines ever to grace electronic circuitry. So if you do enjoy this or anything else that I put together, then please help by subscribing, sticking a comment down below and a thumbs up or even a thumbs down and the reason why you don't. And also on Patreon, if you can give me dollars or pounds, this kind of content really is supported by each and every one of those that support me on Patreon and I truly am grateful. So if you can, please give any dollars or pounds. If you can afford it, it really helps. But otherwise, I'll be back for part two very soon. So stick around for that. And to ensure you don't miss it, click the bell down below and then you can hear that little ding when that part two is up. I'll catch you on the next one.